No. This is this is this is it, dude. This what I'm looking at is the game I wanted from another studio since Dark Souls 2 came out. This is it. This is the one. This is it. People who don't think that this is it will never be satisfied by any game that ever comes out in their entire life. This is it. This is the one. I could kiss this game. I want to hug the director. I want I want this game in my DMs. All right? <laughs> If it if it if this game peaks beyond this moment, I will cry. <laughs>series is loosely classified as an action RPG and they rapidly became an incredibly popular subgenre in the video game world. Starting with Demon's Souls back in 2009 and developed by From Software and arguably perfected in 2011 with Dark Souls which lest we forget for all of the rabid Souls fans who just saw the title of this video and are already seething at the mouth like an overflowing washing machine it won <clears throat> the ultimate game of all time at the Golden Joysticks Award in 2021. Souls likes as a subgenre have birthed a near countless number of reiterations from a number of different studios, all based on that original game from From Software. From Software have since released essentially two sequels to the original Dark Souls game with Dark Souls 2, Dark Souls 3, and have since experimented with the initial game's formula with Bloodborne, Sekiro, and finally came back full circle by returning to the Dark Souls formula paired with a massive open world through Elden Ring. No matter what though, the genre always comes back to what Demon's Souls began with, which is a large emphasis on enemy-led combat, tough enemies, grueling boss fights, excellent and intricate level design, and in my opinion, a great emphasis on exploration and obtuse quests. My history with the Souls games is rather weird, but I was right there from the beginning. I had an old friend of mine who was trying to get me to play Demon Souls, which they got through Gamefly, and they were adamant that I would love it. But I was pretty confident that I wouldn't, because at that time I didn't really get RPG games, and especially ones that looked like this. But after reluctantly making a character whose name was literally a random assortment of letters because I was confident I would give up the game in under an hour, I very quickly found myself clicking with the pace of the game's combat and even though I was getting my ASS handed to me, I was having more fun with a video game than I had had for roughly 5 years. I eventually bought the game for myself and somehow managed to beat it, but I skipped a FUCKLOAD before Dark Souls came out. Dark Souls in all of its sprawling beauty with a game world that is honestly still so impressive that it's a genuine miracle that it's real was so intimidating that I actually didn't finish it or literally any other Souls game until 2019. But once I finally got the confidence to actually beat one of these fucking things later in my life, I became obsessed again with them and have since beaten all of the games in the main series at least two times despite my dislike for Dark Souls 3. And I have since beaten all of the modern From Software catalog with the exception of Elden Ring at least once. It's hard to actually oversell the influence of the Souls games as it not only spawned an entire subgenre, but it has since influenced thousands of what would be normal gamers into hateful little shitheads online who spout Dark Souls to be the single greatest thing that has ever graced their lives, and anyone who has an issue with any of these games to be unable to see the genius of these games or their lord and savior, Hidetaka Miyazaki. And look, I know that the title of this video seems a bit hyperbolic and a little bit clickbaity. And I need to let you know here and now, if you haven't been on my channel before and you haven't clicked off this video yet and or haven't left a hateful little comment proving my point, I love these games. My ranking of these games might be insane to some of you, but I can't emphasize enough 
how much I love these games. I love them! They have become podcast games for me, and I don't know about you, but for me, that's a big deal. I can just turn these games on and zone out and play through sections of the game at a time until either my eyes glaze over or I get creamed one too many times and get a little bit frustrated. Either way, though, I'm saying to myself at the end of the day, I guess enough is enough for now. The amusingly difficult thing about this fact is that there are only so many times that you can play through these games before you get tired of them. It doesn't matter how much you love any game. Sure, you can add mods that change the game a little bit or drastically, essentially completely overhauling the entire framework of the game, but at the end of the day, there are really only seven of these games made by From Software, And that's where the Souls-like subgenre really comes into play. But this is the monkey's paw wish, because while there are hundreds, if not thousands of Souls-like out there, there are only a tiny, tiny handful that are, in my opinion, even worthwhile to play through. And this brings up the rather important question, what makes a Souls game good? I ask this question because these studios pumping out these Souls likes must be struggling with this exact question because the ones that even are worth playing through don't hold a candle to the standard set by From Software. The best in the genre have their own unique strengths, but never truly have their weaknesses even out against those positive ones. A game like Neo, for instance, can honestly introduce a really interesting combat system of stances. But the game is hindered by a truly atrocious system of micromanaging every single aspect of clothing and weapon attention. Almost literally, more than half the playtime of Neo is spent in the menu comparing numbers to other numbers, which would normally be fine by me as I love Euro Trash board games, and doing exactly that is what I love doing in those board games. But when I'm playing a Souls-like, I kinda just want to play the fucking thing. A game like Thymesia, however, has a wonderful continuation of the parry mechanic of Sekiro with its own little kinda unique spin on the stamina bar also in Sekiro. But the problem that I think I have with Thymesia is that, just like a lot of other quality souls likes, there seems to be this inescapable reality of the game just being a little janky. Sure, the game is fun, and it's one of the ones that I hold in the highest regard in the subgenre of Souls likes, but there's no escaping the fact that the game's a little janky. What I'm getting at is that no game, despite all of the faults that I think are basically intrinsically imprinted onto the DNA of From Software games, no studio has even come close to matching what the studio in Miyazaki can push out. Lies of P, however, has always appeared different, at least to me. When the game got truly unveiled with an early gameplay teaser, myself and many others were impressed by what we saw, but we always had that reasonable concern for doubt. Yeah, you know, it looks good, but I doubt it'll play half as well, is a phrase that I heard a countless number of times from the Soulsborne fandom. And I mean, yeah, that was always on the table, but the more that Round 8 Studios showed us of the game, the more confident I became that these people knew what they were doing. They would trickle out visuals of information that alluded to many tweaks of the Souls gameplay like a new type of durability system, as well as its own unique taste of the Shinobi prosthetic from Sekiro. But the thing that really turned my world upside down was when they finally dropped a demo for the game earlier this year. Not only was the gameplay just exquisite, but the confidence that the devs showcased in their game was honestly the most reassuring thing about that demo. I made a whole video about my takeaway from the demo that I can link here if you want, but it showcased three entire boss battles and plenty of separate systems including not only combat, but level ups, your legion arm, a skill tree, as well as others. No studio would put out a demo of that length and showcase the amount of stuff in their game if they weren't sure that people wouldn't like it. I beat that demo upwards, and I'm not kidding, 15 times because I was just flat out astounded by what it presented to me. 
a Souls-like that could actually match and potentially surpass From Software's monopoly on the subgenre. But now I'm sitting here to tell you that I've beaten Liza P and have mostly gotten through a new game plus, and I can safely say without a shadow of a doubt in my mind that not only is this my favorite Souls-like that has ever been made, not by From Software, but it is potentially my number one favorite game in the entire subgenre, and that is including From Software games. People are giving this game plenty of praise, and that's great, but I really don't think that people are appreciating what this game is as well as not lauding the studio for the impressive way they managed to make this game as good as it is. Lies of P is more than a good Souls-like. It's more than a great copy of a Souls game. It's more than all of that. Lies of P has ruined Dark Souls for me. So let me just get this out of the way right now. I firmly believe that this game was pretty much made for me. And if you want to know whether or not that you're also me, I have a handy little rule of thumb for you to follow. If your top three Souls games are Sekiro, Bloodborne, and Dark Souls 2 specifically, then I have the utmost confidence in saying, just stop watching this, get Lies of P, and go play it. You will love this game. If you're not me, which honestly, you know, good for you, then you are the one that I need to talk to. So I must come back to this original question of what makes a Souls game good? So like I had mentioned earlier, there are some things that qualify a game to be a Souls-like, and they usually come down to these few factors that I'll expand on here. 1. Deliberate and methodical combat. 2. Meticulously detailed animations. 3. A light RPG system that can lean towards gear-specific builds, even if this is arguably the least important mechanical similarity. 4. Boss battles that incentivize you to learn and master their attack patterns. 5. Intricate level design that utilizes shortcuts to help the player's progress to the next 6. Bonfire, lamp, idol, checkpoint, whatever the fuck you want to call them, that resets enemies in the area upon use of them. So, most of these points are strictly a bullet point that a studio would have to check to qualify it as a Souls-like. It doesn't really qualify the quality of these gameplay points. But Lies of P, while not necessarily breaking new ground with many of these design pillars, consistently passed the bar with flying colors, and in my opinion, honestly, kind of show up from software at their own game with just a few of these tweaks and changes that the team brought to this game. It's really these slight adjustments to the standard scale set by FromSoft that really elevates this game to the heights that I'm praising it at. Some tweaks are more drastically implemented than others, but each one meshed together into this awesome claw-shaped little heart that Lies of P really is. One of my favorite quality of life features that the game introduces is this beautiful little idea that adds these little quest icons to specific stargazer checkpoints that help remind you that you have a quest to complete here. Sometimes it's just the face of a character you need to talk to, like Mr. Vanini back at the Hotel Crot, but also sometimes it's just blatantly an item that you're carrying. Souls games have always had this design philosophy of quest designs that lean hard into the obtuse and occasionally hallucinatory. Talk to this person, get this vague, nondescript description or dialogue of a specific thing, and just kind of hope that you wrote it down and remembered to go do something that you're only 80% sure is actually the right thing. When all is said and done, sometimes it just leads to a conclusion of a narrative quest which tends to end in an incredibly vague and nondescript voiceover that appears to indicate that something has happened, but you may not even be sure of what. Of course, there is always the literal item reward such as a weapon or a spell of some sort. Now, there is something to be said about this style of quest design. It invites conversation, provokes the imagination, and even rewards due diligence. Am I shaming this style of quest design? No, not really. But it does come with inherent issues for player engagement. What Lies of P contributes to this style of quest design is, in a sense, having its cake and eating it too. 
What is lost, so to say, in allowing the player to be able to look at a listed locations and say, oh yeah, I need to go do that, pretty much eliminating the reward of solve the puzzle on your own, still gives the obvious physical or literal reward item, but still leaves the player with the conclusion to a loose thread. A depressing line spoke by a fallen enemy that gleans some sort of undefinable assurance of a character's relation with another, or the simple idea of something bigger happening beyond the scenes. And that leads to another tweak, and in my opinion, improvement to the standard, which is actual storytelling. <laughs> Disclaimer! I have not played Armor Core 6 at the time of making this video. Yes, Sekiro has done this before Lysipede. I'm not saying that one is better than the other, but what I will say is that Sekiro's story, while actually pretty good, is not enough to make up for the fact that the entire modern catalog of From Software games, except for Sekiro, has a story. It's nice to see a game of this quality actually have a coherent narrative that is relatively easy to follow and still has a lot of interpretive benefactors of a traditional Souls-like. I could tell you roughly the narrative of the game having only really beaten it once at this point in time, but for story purposes, I won't go into detail because that's not really the focus of this video, but it was genuinely so refreshing to see a game of this nature tell a story that actually touched me and made me feel rotten inside on multiple occasions. Another thing that is added that, in my opinion, was the first real big change that a lot of people were aware of, which is the brilliant system of combining blades to handles. In a traditional Souls game, being based on standard RPG stats like life, stamina, strength, dex, etc., you are guaranteed to find a weapon that you were just unable to use because of it being out of your character's skill set. While Lysa P doesn't completely eliminate this issue, it does mitigate it pretty strongly based on these two things. One, that the magic stat isn't really based on a specific playstyle, but is instead delegated to the boost of your legion arm and its abilities. The legion arm is essentially this game's re-implementation of the shinobi prosthetic from Sekiro, and in a sense, works a lot closer to the arcane system in Bloodborne, as it also can affect some of your weapon stat bonuses. Two. The fact that you can swap and interchange weapon blades and weapon handles. This system is so fucking cool. So in P, blades and handles are swappable. And what this means is that your handle is delegated to your attack animations, as well as your weapon stat requirements, as well as possibly not granting you your ideal stat bonus. You find a blade that initially deals big damage, but it's attached to a handle that is not geared towards your build. Find a handle that will work. Do you have two handles that will work? Even better! Try them both and see which moveset you like more. And even better yet, you can assemble and disassemble at no cost. Find the weapon that works for you. What this means is that you can essentially make your ideal dex-based greatsword, which is what I did. Now arguably, my personal favorite full-on addition is this implementation of a skill tree. As I've gotten older, I've come to enjoy many, many more types of games. And during that process, I've come to realize that I really, really love board games. And what I love about some of my favorite board games is this really obvious mechanical usage of gaining a skill set while in the game. There is something to be said about a game, video or otherwise, whose design is based around mastering its systems and becoming better at what is given to you. A game like chess, for instance, isn't fun because you can unlock an ability that makes your pawns move an additional two spaces, or something that you can use to make your rocks move diagonally for a turn. It's based on skill and skill alone. But I've come to realize that over the years that I really do enjoy artificial progression. The version of chess where you can unlock an ability that makes your king invincible for a turn, or where your bishops are bombs that destroy all in its radius. Lies of P is still absolutely a skill-based game, make no doubt about it, but it utilizes a skill tree system that is personally unlike anything I have ever seen. It functions relatively normally as one would expect, but in order to activate and unlock any of the skills on the tree, you must first find quartz, and you use those to unlock the skill. But what makes this system just fucking awesome is the fact that each quartz can, in turn, unlock its own special ability. So not only do you get the skill that you wanted, but you also get small buffs added onto it, allowing for so many little niche build varieties to a game that already has a potential endless weapon combination and movesets. 
That's a game of the year, dude. Another seemingly small but actually super important addition to the formula is the durability mechanic. Did you ever wonder while playing a Souls game what the point of all of these repair items were apart from being used as a quick fix if you find yourself in an area or against an enemy that is designed to literally rapidly drain your equipment's durability? As a solution to that problem, the mechanic works well enough, but always felt like a forced necessity. Like FromSoft sort of said, Given the nature of this game, we should probably not make equipment invulnerable. And then added the mechanic as a means to an end. And yes, I know that Demon Souls implementation is a lot more brutal, but generally speaking, FromSoft made the mechanic almost useless, but definitely made it light on the required attention during your gameplay sessions. Liza P, while removing the durability from your drip altogether, has actively made the weapon durability mechanic become not only integral to the gameplay, but part of an overall constant combat strategy. If you don't pay attention to this little meter during intense combat encounters, specifically bosses, then it's actually not unlikely that you'll be swinging away at it and just accidentally break your own weapon, forcing you to equip another one during combat. But even though that it's most utilized during boss fights, it's also nearly just as easy to forget while wandering around the game's levels. It's a simple addition, but truly adds this dimension to combat that no other Souls game can really equal to. Lies of P's combat, while arguably not as fluid like a game such as Sekiro, still taught me a very valuable lesson. Souls games are at their best when they get rid of iframes. And look, Lies of P still does have iframes. I think the proper wording of that sentence should be, Souls games are at their best when they don't make using iframes the single best option. I don't keep it a secret to anyone that I do not play the Souls games for the boss fights. There are exceptions here and there. If I ever run through Dark Souls 3, for instance, for whatever reason, I will likely do it just to fight the Dragon Slayer armor. Demon Souls has the Flame Lurker. Dark Souls 1 has Artorias. Dark Souls 2 has, well, kind of, sort of, like a lot of the boss fights in 2. Bloodborne has Father Gascoigne, and Sekiro has... Well, okay, I like most of the boss fights in Sekiro 2, but I'll get back to that one. What I'm getting at is that while I don't hate bosses in FromSoft games, all I'm saying is that I do not play them for the boss fights. I play them for the level design. The Souls series gets a lot of credit for its epic boss fights and insane difficulty, but I think that only Dark Souls 1 really gets praised for its level design. As I've stated before, the nature of its interconnected world not only impresses today, but back when it was released, it was practically a revelation. The way that Lodran, is that how you say it? The way that Lodran effectively is shaped like a diamond, with so many pathways that loop back on themselves or connect to completely different locations that you've been to previously, is something while not unique to Dark Souls. I have since affectionately and jokingly referred to any game that remotely follows this level design concept as the game Dark Soulsing me. <gasps> Oh my god, oh my god, I just got Dark Souls so fucking hard right now, I can't even- Oh my god. But the whole series is filled to the brim with top tier level design. The uphill battle you must endure to even make it to the bosses is truly the glue that holds the series and gameplay together. Lies of P, in my opinion, carries this tradition very proudly as pretty much every individual location in the game is excellently designed and executed on. From graveyards, to ruined cathedrals, to ancient temples, to everyday city streets, the world of Krat and its connecting locations ooze atmosphere, intricacy, and well-placed enemies that always keep you on edge. Even though Krat doesn't blend seamlessly together in the same way that Lodoran does, as the city of Krat usually links to larger locations behind a generic loading screen, the actual maps themselves are nothing less than impressive. And that's not to say that Liza P doesn't have those wow moments when you realize a place loops back on top of itself, unlocking a completely new route to take from the game's main hub, which is the Hotel Krat. A majority of the locations in the game are what I like to call simple but intricate in their design. And what I mean by that is while you are essentially walking a straight path through each of the main locations, they bob and weave and walk back on each other in a very clever manner. That being said, however, there are still many levels in the game that are intricate, but also truly showcase the team's ability to flex their creative muscles. 
My favorite location in the entire game is the Lorenzini. I, Lorenzini, I'm Italian, I should know how to say this. My favorite location in the whole game, as far as actual level design is concerned, is the Lorenzini Arcade, as it's the first location in the game that breaks free from the confines of the relative straightforward design that I mentioned earlier. This level is not only a light maze, but you will constantly loop back to the one single stargazer, which is this game's bonfire equivalent, multiple times. And each time you do, you will have opened another pathway that cuts the walk back towards progress by about a third until you finally break through to the next section of the game. It's just a masterful execution of what feels like a perfect blend of new and old level design. New in the sense that it still absolutely feels like a modern Souls-like title, but old school in the sense that I could so easily see this entire section of the game laid out in a maze-like 2D side-scroller where you have to enter through doors to progress through different screens to unlock doors and progress. At the end of the day, while Liza P doesn't necessarily innovate on the Souls formula when it comes to the genre's level design, it sure as hell knows what makes a Souls world polished and constantly impresses by the quality of its levels. And that's nothing to say about the game's atmosphere. Lies of P pretty much from day one was called by fans of the game as Bloodborne 2 due to its very obvious aesthetic choices. It goes into plenty of familiar and yet uncharted territory. What starts as a pretty simple game about finding Geppetto and killing puppets quickly becomes a rather in-depth story about ambition, sacrifice, and turning the plot points of Pinocchio on its head and asking some truly philosophical questions about what it means to have a soul, what a soul even is, and what defines a human. Lies of P is as somber and as melancholy as the genre can get without being drenched in genre tropes. It feels as empty as Dark Souls 2 and as foreboding as Bloodborne, while still maintaining a tough balance of well-written characters, tragic plot points and storylines, and a beautiful soundtrack, all leading back towards this feeling of hollowness which, funnily enough, perfectly suits being in a game where you play as Pinocchio. But the thing that really elevates Liza P into the status that I hold it in now is more straightforward than that. It's really just the combat. Liza P as a Souls-like play is like Dark Souls. No, that's not right. Liza P as a Souls-like borrows heavily from Dark Souls but feels more like Bloodborne. No, that's still not it either. Lies of P as a Souls-like borrows heavily from Dark Souls, but it's actually a combination of combat mechanics from both Bloodborne and Sekiro. Yeah, that's it. But that's really just the surface layer of this point that I'm making, because while you could just stop the qualifier of the game's combat loop there, you'd be missing out on so many little things that the game does. If you've ever had a little annoyance with any of the combat systems in Dark Souls, like durability not being important, or being unable to use a weapon that you found because it's outside of your skill set, or hell, if you've ever found yourself in my shoes and don't really enjoy the overall boss encounters of the Souls series, or even if you've never played a Souls game, Lies of P has the potential of making a fan out of you yet and improving on all of those little annoying instances. And especially because, as I explained in the previous section, and how I'll detail this in the upcoming section, Round 8 Studios found a way to make the game as accessible as possible, and streamline the Souls formula in nearly every single way feasible, except for the game's combat, which is arguably just as hard and just as demanding as the most cherished of Souls games. Souls combat, by its very nature, is a system of mechanics that gear the player towards a deadlocked one-on-one -on -one combat. They may not always play to their own system strengths, but generally speaking, that is the nature of Souls games combat. It's so engaging, partially because of the narrow, focused nature that the games present its combat to you in, but also because of the fact that the game is difficult. Unlike a lot of games where the most basic enemies are dangerous really only in groups with the threat of being overwhelmed, the Souls games ride high on this ability to make practically every enemy in the game potentially very deadly. And what that means in turn is that every enemy requires you to study its attacks and react accordingly to them. The way that the Souls games help you deal with this issue is one of two ways. 
you can block attacks like a coward or dodge. The Souls games sure as hell didn't invent iframes, but they sure as hell popularized them and essentially changed the focus and overall use of them since Dark Souls was released back in 2011. Dodging in Souls games works on a pretty simple system of the game giving invincibility frames during specific weight type dodges. The issue that I have with dodging is that with the Souls games in particular, with Bloodborne being affected really only by proxy, is that while the game does allow for blocking, unless you're doing the heavy Chevy totally ding dong dandy Havel build, then dodging is pretty much the only real option that gives the players any real way to interact with the game's already enemy-led combat design. And just to be clear, as a side, what I mean by enemy-led combat design is that the game's pace of combat is dictated less by the player, and much more so by the enemy or the AI of the game in general. A simple example differentiating the two would be a game like Ocarina of Time, and a game like the 2005 God of War. A bizarre comparison, I know, but in Ocarina, the combat is, as one Mr. Screamin' Slim Thick Legend icon of the internet will tell you, filled with so much goddamn waiting. And this means that you're essentially only allowed to engage with the combat on the enemy's terms. You can't attack and in turn dodge an attack unless the enemy opens itself up for an attack. This gives the game a very duelist nature and makes not only the pace of combat slow, but not controlled by the player. God of War, by contrast, is pretty much just <laughs> And getting back to Dark Souls, even with dodging being pretty much the single best way to avoid damage, and even giving blocking the benefit of the doubt, as it does take significantly less skill at the game to accomplish, is, at least to me, kind of boring. It's a completely fine way to play the game, and you do you if that's the way you want to play Souls games. But as we'll get into later, I think a lot of what makes the Souls games fun, at its core, is the accrual of skills while playing through the game. Dodging, to speak positively on it for a moment, is a fun way to interact with the combat. It requires precise timing and a base skill floor to be able to do effectively. Lies of P, however, manages to make the blocking mechanic from the Souls games actually, you know, good? Or, at the very least, not an objectively worse option than it has been in Dark Souls. What Lies of P does is simply rework the already wonderful rally mechanic of Bloodborne, where you would be able to regain health by attacking enemies after health has been lost, but only for a brief window of time. And what this did in Bloodborne is further incentivize aggression, because if you can get your damage up to a certain threshold, then it's not unlikely that you can just tank a bunch of damage because you're getting the health back just as fast, or at least fast enough that you can outpace the damage being dealt to you. I think that this mechanic in the game is carrying most of the weight in relation to the much more aggressive style of gameplay that Bloodborne promotes and incentivizes. And I feel like it's because of the really effective way that Bloodborne pushes its aggression onto you and actually succeeds at making that work that not many people believed that it could be improved on. From Software, being the infallible gods among us that they are, could never be improved upon. But guess what they did! See, what Lies of P tweaks and changes to the rally mechanic is actually sort of brilliant. Now, you aren't able to recover health that's just lost. It has to be lost through your blocking mechanic. Now, that sounds significantly less aggressive than Bloodborne. And yes, it's not. But what that means for combat is that it allows for you to have a viable way of dealing with the game on a more simple manner that still requires some modicum of skill out of the player. Sure, in both cases you are still just blocking, but the fact that you have to react offensively to your defensive reaction to an attack means that it's not just you waiting for an opening, but instead forcing you to respond back into combat from what would be a relatively safe stance. Making the rally mechanic be one behind blocking instead of just normal damage gives even more control of the mechanic to the player. Whereas in Bloodborne, damage dealt to you is simply just a mistake you've made, whether it's by being too greedy or a missed dodge input, Lies of P gives all of the agency of its rally mechanic entirely to you. 
Sometimes that forced nature of response is one that gets you barely scraping by with the health that you could recover, or maybe you see an opportunity and just barely missing it, resulting in you taking more damage or even dying. But just blocking, taking less damage, and knowing if I hit back with a combo attack now, I can get all of my health back is such an engaging spin on the rally mechanic. And I know this is going to sound crazy, but hear me out. Even Lies of P's basic combat is much more engaging than a normal Souls game. Because Lies of P adds this other option to the table for defense, and while not really a new concept, it is new to the gameplay of Dark Souls. I'm being very specific when I say that, because obviously Sekiro exists, but Sekiro is even arguable by many to even be a Souls-like. But even to those people that do consider it to be one, I don't think that even they would agree that Sekiro plays like Dark Souls. On the contrary, I think most people would feel pretty confident in saying Bloodborne and Dark Souls play very similarly. Be sure to hydrate. Please sponsor me, Liquid Death. What Lies of P does is add this deflect or parry system to its combat. And what this does is stunningly make Lies of P really feel like a sequel to Sekiro, or at the very least, finally letting us see what Sekiro would look like if it was made as a much more standard Souls like. <gasps> That's a game of the year, dude. What parrying does, not only to this game, but what it also did to Sekiro is simply forcing the player into combat. And going real quickly back into dodging, real fast this time I promise, it's not gonna be that much longer, I swear to God. <laughs> I thought long and hard about this because I was left with a curious thought experiment. Why, at least in my opinion, does parrying attack feel so much better than just dodging one? Because when you think about it, they're the exact same concept and the exact same player input. Why does spam dodging in Dark Souls feel less skill intensive and less fun to me than, let's say, spam parrying? Realistically, there should be pretty much no emotional difference between the two. But I thought about it quite a lot and I came to this conclusion. Dodging, pretty much by definition, takes you out of combat. Parrying forces you into combat and makes the player the aggressor. Even just look at someone casually playing Dark Souls versus someone playing, let's say Sekiro. Someone playing Dark Souls would tend to physically lurch backwards in a defensive manner because dodging is a defensive maneuver. Versus that same person playing Sekiro, you'll likely find that person leaning into the screen with each successful parry as their lips tighten and their body jolts with a preemptive surge of violent joy as they wait to hear the clash of steel from their speakers. Each of these types of interaction with the game are, in an objective sense, the exact same thing. But it's the reaction that each one gives where I think the differences really start. Lies of P takes the same sort of visceral intensity of pushing you into the action and adds these little nuances to the gameplay that just elevate the experience to be quite unlike anything that FromSoft has made up until this point. What I meant earlier about FromSoft games being better when iframes aren't so heavily incentivized is that it leads to a much more even playing field between me and the game itself. In Dark Souls, I always just find myself being hit a lot more frequently than I do in Sekiro or in Lies of P. The FromSoft formula when iframes are far less useful leads to me studying enemy moves much more intently and reacting much more forcefully, and in turn being that much more engaged with the game. Whereas in Dark Souls, I would often find myself getting annoyed at boss encounters just hoping to be able to move on to the next area and explore it. In Sekiro and in Liza P, I found myself actively anticipating each boss battle in the endurance of having to learn their movesets. If you ask me, the entire combat system of Liza P is built entirely around aggression, and I personally think that the team nailed designing the game in such a way that not only rewards aggressive play, but incentivizes it too. 
Liza P knows what is important to the faster paced stylings of Sekiro and Bloodborne and throws it perfectly into the well balanced nature of the original Dark Souls. And unlike Sekiro, where the parry system was used more or less as a means to an end to abuse the game's unique battle and HP systems, Liza P adds and subtracts what would work best in a Souls formula. But what's great about Liza P is that even though that parrying is clearly the defensive system that the game is trying to get you to learn and to master, if you're having difficulty with getting the parry down, unlike Sekiro, dodging is still completely viable in Liza P. Sure, I didn't really utilize it, hardly at all, but I've definitely done it, and I know for a fact that they do give you enough iframes to work with. Will you still get crushed if you only dodge? Yes. Do you need to learn to parry? Yes. But all this means is that the game gives more options for you to work with depending on the situation and whittle those skills down to a fine tooth rapier that you can use to stick into the cogs and gears of your enemies. No Souls game really gives you this much agency in terms of the actual dance of combat than what Lies of P gives you. In Lies of P, the poise system remains more or less unchanged from Sekiro in the sense that each enemy, including yourself, has a meter that is depleted upon taking damage or being parried that will result in their attacks being thrown off kilter, allowing you to attack freely for a few moments or allow you to get one high damage attack in. But unlike in Sekiro, the meter in Lies of P is completely invisible to you. I'm personally not sure where I stand on my thoughts on this, but I know that having it there would allow the player to strategize and attack around it, whereas it being invisible tends to have you sort of swinging blind occasionally, just praying that this charge attack will finally be the one that staggers the enemy, letting you get the necessary attacks in to fill up your pulse charges, which, coincidentally, is the last thing that ties into this final big twist on the From Software formula that Round 8 has put into Liza P. What they did is really so simple, but when put into practice, it changes the entire meta of combat. All they did was just allow you to recharge one use of your pulse charge after it's depleted. The way that you recharge it is simply hit an enemy. This simple change makes all of the difference in the world when it comes to the flow and feel of combat. You ever been playing Dark Souls or watching someone play Dark Souls and they have one charge of their SS Flask during a boss and they have like 60% of their HP remaining? Odds are you or that person you're watching won't use that last charge because it would be a waste. You'd want to save it, deal some damage, and if you get hit again, then use it because you would get so much more HP back this way and it would feel like less of a waste. In Lies of P, you're incentivized to use that last charge because you're not at full health and you can just get another charge back while dealing damage to a boss at full health and then get another charge on backup for later. It makes you feel confident in being aggressive. It also leads to these truly wonderful instances where you're low on health and you're so desperately close to refilling your last charge and when you're swinging away at an enemy and you finally hear that bing, there's no better feeling in the world that could happen in that moment. You back up, recharge, get a bunch of HP back and just keep going in for the kill. <sighs> This game's pretty good. I can only hope that I'm selling you on this as hard as I'm feeling it because I don't know if I can properly emphasize and put into words how much of a change this little tweak brings to the game's combat. It really ties the room together. At the beginning of this video, well, Okay, more like the early part of the video, I guess. I asked the question, what makes a Souls game good? And I think that my answer to this would be, a Souls-like exceeds expectations when it has level design that showcases the hallmarks of the genre in a way that can still surprise you, and at the same time, still feels natural to explore and to discover. 
A Souls-like game can feel like quality when its systems put into place actively incentivize the kind of action that the developers want from you. A Souls-like doesn't feel like jank when its animation work is meticulous and well thought out and implemented. A Souls-like game is at its best when your feelings of frustration are never the emotion that you feel throughout a majority of its runtime. Oh, you've got to be shitting my fucking balls off right now. And that last point is really only achieved when the first three criteria are met. Lies of P came out of nowhere, relatively speaking, and showed us that you can wear your influences on your sleeve and still demonstrate to the world that there is more to be tapped out of the systems and mechanics that From Software laid out for the world back in 2009 with Demon Souls. It may be weird and, I guess, only at the end of my point will you understand, cliche to say, but I do my best to be a good boy to you, the one watching. You take the time out of your day to watch my videos, listen to what I have to say about games, and Lies of P has me in a pretty tricky little predicament. I do worry in my little old heart that I may be overhyping this game to some of you. I do suffer occasionally from recency bias. I mean, we all do, but I think that it's important to embrace how art makes you feel at any point during your experience with it. Lies of P made me feel joy that I haven't really felt from a video game in a very long time. Tears of the Kingdom made me feel wonder, but its gameplay bore me down pretty quick. Elden Ring was magic encapsulated into 40 gigabytes, but that magic kind of wore off on me and I still haven't beaten it. Starfield was amazing for the first 30 hours or so, but it quickly lost me. Alan Wake 2 kind of sucks a little, but Lies of P from start to finish made me feel for its characters, feel for its world, feel for its combat, and feel for its soul. And even if in the future I look back on this video and I say that my feelings on Lies of P have waned a bit, or that I even take back my stance on this game's placement in the Souls-like ranking, I don't think that really matters as much as it means to me right now. And I cannot lie. Lies of P has ruined Dark Souls for me. Tomato is a fluid, but it's also a vegetable. I can't even believe how good this game is. Dude, this is like the Paddington 2 of video games. <laughs>